Good morning, everyone. Uh, welcome to day two of uh, Bridge Spine. Um, it's my great pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Brian Kwan from uh, Vancouver, who's a renowned uh, spinal surgeon and research scientist. Um, Brian, as you'll see, has dedicated his career uh, to advancing the understanding and treatments for spinal cord injuries, and his contributions uh, to the field is widely recognized uh, by his peers. Uh, Brian started his career as, as an orthopedic resident at UBC in 2000 and went on to, to complete a PhD in neurosciences at UBC studying spinal cord injuries. Um, he then went on to do his spinal fellowship, um, extremely busy spinal fellowship with Alex Vaccaro um, at the Bothman Institute in Thomas Jefferson University Hospital. Uh, Brian's a full professor and attending surgeon at the Vancouver Spinal Surgical Institute. Uh, it's a level one trauma center and he's the Dvorak Chair of Trauma there. He's involved in training both neurosurgeons as well as orthopedic surgeons and currently is co-director also of the Spinal Fellowship Training Program uh, and many of his previous fellows are actually here in, in the audience uh, today. Um, in addition to extremely busy clinical practice, uh, Brian has a very active um, science and clinical research program. He's director of research uh, for the Vancouver Spa Research Program, uh, which oversees all areas of research at VGH. He's the associate director of clinical research uh, at, um, and principal investigator for i -Cord, and that's where his lab, the Quan Lab, is also based as well. Um, his interest in human pathophysiology of spinal cord injuries uh, has led him to establish the International Spinal Cord Injury Biobank, which I believe has over 61,000 fluid specimens and actual 16 spinal cords as well, which is quite amazing. So without further ado, um, I'm going to, to leave the stage to Brian. I think we'll find his talk um, both captivating, informative and very thought-provoking, and we'll all benefit from his expertise. So please join me in welcome Dr. Brian Kwan to the stage. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> terrific. Thank you, Robert. And um, great to be here. Thank you very much for the invitation. It's, uh, it's great to be amongst friends. And uh, it uh, had a great night out last night. So really appreciate the invitation and uh, obviously the, the British hospitality. Uh, my, I'm going to talk about, or the title of my talk is about novel approaches to cervical spinal cord injury. And um, I, I hail from Vancouver, British Columbia, which is a beautiful uh, part of the world. Uh, my practice is at Vancouver General Hospital, and uh, our lab is at the Blessing Spinal Cord Center. Um, we have nine surgeons in our group, five ortho, four neuro, and, uh, and then my uh, scientific lab is also uh, occupies part of the Blessing Spinal Cord Center. Uh, one of my disclaimers that uh, uh, people are often confused about is that while I actually focus my scientific and uh, academic career on, on spinal cord injury, I'm actually not a neurosurgeon. Um, I don't have those technically fine hands of the Mark Cotters of the world. And uh, we joke in Canada that we're much more of this sort of happy-go-lucky phenotype. Um, but uh, while I am actually not in neurosurgeon, I was probably never as smart as Mark, uh, we, we do wonder, I, I wonder a lot about what the neurosurgeons are actually doing and particularly around the management of traumatic brain injury. Um, and I think that there's a lot that we could learn from the, the neurosurgeons around the management of, of traumatic brain injury and translate that into the way we treat spinal cord injury. So that's a, a, a big part of my talk. Um, these are the four things that I, when I arrived in Glasgow, I was gonna talk about. I was gonna talk about spinal cord perfusion pressure monitoring using lumbar intrathecal catheters, which is an initiative we have ongoing. I was going to talk about our near-infrared biosensor for epidural monitoring of spinal cord oxygenation, serum biomarkers of spinal cord injury, and then our biobank that Robert referred to. Um, I made a late-night decision last night to change this talk because everybody I met at the reception wanted to talk about um, central cord injury. So I'm actually going to talk a little bit about surgical decompression, which is near and dear to the hearts of, I think, most of us, and, uh, and the timing of decompression in central cord. So these are devices apparently that do exist in Vancouver. So that's somebody having a, uh, suffering a cervical spinal cord injury from this fracture dislocation. And as spine surgeons, we obviously wonder like, what can we do now to try to improve their function? We do surgical decompression and we can hemodynamically manage their mean arterial blood pressure. And that's kind of the gist of it, when you think about it, for what we can offer patients when they come in. So I've been very interested in this aspect of hemodynamic management for a while. There are guidelines that exist from the AANS, CNS to maintain the mean arterial blood pressure from 85 to 90 for a period of the first seven days after injury. 
When you survey all of that literature in a very systematic way, you come to the conclusion that, in fact, the evidence that links these MAP targets to improvement in neurological function is actually very weak. And it does make you wonder whether MAP is truly the best metric. The neurosurgeons, of course, find this relatively intuitive, because in traumatic brain injury, of course, the cerebral perfusion pressure is equal to the MAP minus the intracranial pressure, and they measure that with those EVDs that they put into the brain. That's why we keep on getting bumped at, from our surgical slates at night. Now, in uh, traumatic spinal cord injury, the relationship is, is physiologically the same. The spinal cord perfusion pressure, or SCPP, is equal to the MAP minus the CSF pressure. And you can measure that pressure with the lumbar intrathecal catheter. Um, it's fairly standard neurosurgical stuff. So we initiated a study a number of years ago called CAMPER, where we started to place lumbar intrathecal catheters into patients with acute spinal cord injuries. And other surgeons were interested in kind of joining that effort because we thought, well, this is a pretty straightforward thing to do. And we asked the question about these three physiological parameters. How do they actually relate to neurological outcome in terms of the conversion of Asia grade and motor score improvement? And uh, this analysis was done by some uh, brilliant colleagues of mine down in, uh, back in Vancouver. So here are all of the spinal cord perfusion pressure measurements, MAP measurements, and CSF pressure measurements from about, a, about 90 patients that we put these intrathecal catheters into. And with every one of these data points, you can actually do a risk analysis for whether or not they improved neurologically over the six-month period. And what we found was that when we looked at the number of times you dropped your spinal cord perfusion pressure below 50, that, uh, that actually portended a much worse prognosis. So the patients with, with, that did not improve had significantly higher episodes where their spinal cord perfusion pressure dropped below 50. Interestingly, this relationship was not present for MAP. And it suggested to us that, indeed, the spinal cord perfusion pressure is probably the more physiologically relevant physio parameter. If you do this kind of analysis on, on exposure to low spinal cord perfusion pressure, you see, particularly in the first 24 hours, that if you're exposed to a low, low spinal cord perfusion pressure in those first 24 hours, it drops your likelihood of conversion by almost 50%. So it seems to be quite relevant. So we published that initially in 2017. We did a, another analysis of that to suggest that a spinal cord perfusion pressure at 65 actually had the highest chances of uh, neurological recovery. And so it raises this question about whether or not, well, if, if the SCPP is more relevant than MAP and a spinal cord perfusion pressure of 65 seems to uh, promote neurological recovery, which is actually better, actively managing somebody's spinal cord perfusion pressure or conventionally managing them with vasopressors? So that would be done with the lumbar intrathecal drain and conventional MAP management with vasopressors. So this is a study that we've embarked on to try to answer that question called CASPER. And it's uh, being done at a number of centers across North America where we're putting in a lumbar intrathecal catheter and trying to drain CSF to lower the CSF pressure and improve the spinal cord perfusion pressure. So there are a number of us across the United States and Canada. Um, Asia A, B, and C patients within 24 hours of injury, they're getting um, serum and blood collected and we're trying to maintain their spinal cord perfusion pressure at 65. Uh, to date, we've enrolled 49 patients in this study, and uh, so it's a bit early to, uh, to have conclusions around that, but we have learned some stuff to date. And one of the things that I think has been really interesting about this trial is that when I talk to you about the fact that, well, we can do surgical decompression and hemodynamic management in the management of these acutely injured patients, the trial has taught us that these two concepts are actually linked. Um, and it is because spinal cord perfusion pressure monitoring with the lumbar catheter is most effective when the spinal cord is fully decompressed. If you look at uh, some of Bijan Arabi's work at shock trauma, he's doing post-operative MRIs, and he would say that in a situation like this where you have occlusion of the subarachnoid space around the, sp the spinal cord, you want to actually try to get a situation where you've got a full and complete kind of surrounding circumferentially CSF around the injured spinal cord after decompression. And we find that this is actually probably important for monitoring the pressure in the lumbar cistern with the intrathecal catheters to try to, that it is important to try to get this intact subarachnoid space around the spinal cord at the level of injury. And, um, and so it has taught us that to do this kind of hemodynamic management, it is actually tied to some extent to the surgical management of the patient. So we think that the hemodynamic management of acute SCI can, in fact, be improved. 
by actually following some of these long-standing principles from, uh, from the traumatic brain injury field. Okay, so this, this is where we're going to do our kind of detour around the novel nearest bow sensor. I'm just going to show you some of the work that we're doing. We have developed an epidural sensor that uses near-infrared spectroscopy that we would apply to the spinal cord and, and kind of secure with to seal to provide uh, oxygenation measures of the injured spinal cord and then pull that out after a period of seven days. This, uh, the vision for this is to actually put it on the spinal cord after we do the surgical decompression uh, to provide us with some uh, uh, real-time measure of what's happening in that first kind of four to seven days after injury. And this was part of our DARPA uh, initiative that we launched a couple years ago with, with the help of DARPA to do something very, in, very ambitious around like multiple biosensors, fully implanted, all wirelessly integrated. So this is sort of the craziness that, uh, that you get into when you work with DARPA. But uh, that I'm not going to talk about because it seemed like everybody wanted to talk about central cord injuries last night. So I'm going to actually talk now about surgical decompression, which is uh, pretty straightforward and I think relevant to, to all of us. And really two aspects of surgical decompression, timing and technique. So I touched a bit about the tec technical aspects of, of uh, surgical decompression. This is a really interesting case that emerged in our institution many years ago where she had a C5-6 uh, fracture dislocation, had an anterior cervical discectomy infusion. Um, <clears throat> and we would say that the spinal cord is, is, uh, is decompressed by doing a realignment of the spinal canal. But if you look at her MRI five days later, it sort of seems like there's a lot of kind of ongoing compression still happening there. And so the question here is, is the, is the cord actually still decompressed? Marius Papadopoulos is a neurosurgeon here in the UK and has done a lot of uh, brilliant work on looking at this interface between the spinal cord and the, and the dura. And what, his, uh, what he has been doing is putting a pressure catheter into the dura, uh, through the dura into this interface between the swollen spinal cord and the dura. And he's been de describing that there can be pressure, almost like a compartment syndrome, as the spinal cord swells against the fecal sac. Now, Bijan Arabi, as I pointed out from the University of Maryland shock trauma, has done a lot of interesting work by doing post-operative MRIs on his patients that he does surgery on, and looking at how the decompression appears after acute cervical spinal cord injury. And he would say that in a case like I showed with no CSF around the spinal cord, that that's a case of an incompletely decompressed spinal cord. Whereas a case like this, where the post-operative MRI shows that, that complete rim of CSF around the cord, that this is actually what he would say is a complete decompression. Now, as it turns out, when he looked at about uh, over 100 of his patients, they found that when they looked at Asia conversion, the patients that had conversion or did improve their Asia grade were the ones that, that, that more likely had this complete decompression around the spinal cord. And conversely, the people, for those that did not convert, a high percentage of them did not have that full rim of CSF around their spinal cord after in their post-operative MRI. So, so there, he suggests that there is actually a, a neurological benefit to trying to attempt to get that complete decompression around the spinal cord. So how do you actually achieve that? In a subsequent paper with almost, almost 190 patients with uh, spinal cord injuries, he showed that if you do anterior surgery alone, in about half the cases, you get that rim of CSF fully around the spinal cord after injury. But in fact, doing a posterior laminectomy and doing increasing numbers of laminectomy give you a higher chance of achieving that complete decompression. Now, there were some patients in his study that even though you do like a five-level laminectomy, you still see this filling of the subarachnoid space. <clears throat> and so, as Bijan pointed out, in seven of his patients out of the 184, even after doing multi-level laminectomy, there was still this appearance that the spinal cord had swollen and filled the, the subarachnoid space. And these are the patients that might benefit from doing an expansile duroplasty. So I know that there's a, currently an ongoing clinical trial to evaluate this. But it turns out that if you do just the conventional multi-level laminectomy, uh, that the vast majority of these cases, you can achieve that complete decompression in. I've actually taken this to heart in the sense that when Bijan published this uh, a few years ago, so this is uh, just an anecdotal N of one, a patient, a young woman who came in with a C4 Asia A injury with uh, multiple fractures in her cervical spine. And in fact, even a month after her initial injury, the physiatrist deemed her to be C4 Asia A with that injury. 
Um, and I did something kind of aggressive because uh, she had many injuries even up at C2. <clears throat> and I took that as an opportunity to actually do a multi-level decompression on her um, and, uh, and make sure that we could get her spinal cord totally decompressed around. Um, <clears throat> she came back to my clinic uh, uh, just a, about a year over her injury. And, um, uh, and at that stage, she was quite surprisingly a T1 AGB. So she actually has completely normal function in her upper extremities which uh, I would say for myself that that was actually quite surprising. For somebody who a month after their injury with the physiatrist deeming them to be a C4 age A to actually recover all of the motor function in her upper extremities. Uh, and she actually had abdominal function that triggered all the way down to, uh, uh, down to T10. So, so I do think that there is, so I think locally we've certainly become a lot more aggressive with, uh, with trying to get that complete decompression around the spinal cord. Now the other, uh, so I think that there's a good rationale to be aggressive in trying to achieve this complete decompression. Uh, if you're gonna go through the trouble of doing a decompression, it also in influences their spinal cord perfusion pressure monitoring. Um, so let's then talk about timing, because this is obviously a, a, a topic that's near and dear to a lot of people's hearts. So I'll just present a few cases. So 24 year old female, high speed MVA, completely quadriplegic at the scene, C4 Asia A, has like a flicker in her biceps on one side. So, and nothing else. So how many people are urgently taking that patient to the operating room for a decompression infusion? So many people, okay. Well, how about this case? So 47 year old male, software engineer falls, rock climbing, has this uh, fracture dislocation and has a incomplete injury, C7 Asia C. So pretty normal in the upper myotomes and as flicker, you know, ones to twos to threes through the lower extremities. So how many people are taking this patient urgently to the operating room? Incomplete injury, okay. So then there's the 75 year old male, falls forward, strikes his chin, hyperextension injury, has this, has also a C4 Asia C injury with the typical kind of severe and dense weakness in his hands. Again, ones and twos and threes in the lower extremities. So how many people are taking this patient urgently to the operating room? couple, yeah. It's pretty different. So many, and how many would watch this patient? Okay, so let's talk about that. In, in 2010, Michael Failings did a survey of almost 1,000 people, spine surgeons around the world. And <clears throat> it's interesting, in this survey questionnaire, they presented that ca a case very similar to that, 47-year-old bilateral facet dislocation. And in the incomplete injury scenario, Almost everybody was taking that patient to the operating room urgently. The highest bar, 73% would take that patient within four to six hours after injury. Similar to the sentiments in this room. So there's a strong consensus for early surgery in patients with incomplete cervical spinal cord injury. But in the hyperextension injury, central cord type patient, it's much more variable. So some people at tw would say 20, within 24 hours, some people 24 to 72, some people kind of five days to six weeks. So it remains, highly controversial, wide variation in surgeon preference for this particular patient. So it's interesting, 96% of patients would take that other, the young person with the incomplete cord injury to surgery, and only 45% would actually do decompression on the older patient with the cervical incomplete spinal cord injury. So why is that? Well, one of the perceptions, obviously, is that the central cord patients, they spontaneously recover and they do fine in the end. But do they all really do fine, if you look at them? We did this study a number of years ago with minimum two-year follow-up on central cord injury patients, and from a motor standpoint, they do actually pretty well, moving from a motor score of almost 60 to a motor score of over 90. So motor recovery is actually very common in these patients. Independent ambulation, most of them ambulated, but almost two-thirds of them suffered significant spasticity with worse FIMS, worse SF36 scores. And they reflect this severe myelopathy kind of case that Mark Cotter talked about yesterday and the impact that that has on their quality of life. So they're not all totally better. If you look at other parts of their health quality, health status and quality of life, we found that these patients complain of neuropathic pain, spasticity, bladder and bowel function. And, and really this is common if you really ask patients how they're doing after their mild central cord injury. So do they all recover fine in the end? I think the answer to that is clearly no. And they're frequently left with significant functional impairments, even though their motor score might actually be pretty good. 
So I think this is a perception that needs to be, uh, that needs to be addressed. The other perception is that somehow the neurological recovery potential is very different between the incomplete cord injury and the central cord injury, kind of like those two cases I showed. And some people are like, oh, well, yeah, like they're, they're, there's, they, get this, they have so much better potential to recover, that's why we don't operate on them. Well, if you look at patients that have incomplete tetraplegia, as the Europeans have done, and they actually looked at patients with incomplete cervical spinal cord injuries and divided them into those that had a central cord pattern and those that had not a central cord pattern of injury. And they looked at their upper and lower extremity motor function over the course of a year. And they found that, in fact, the upper extremity function recovery is the same. And it really, it really actually is better quantified based on their Asia grade. So whether you're in Asia C or in Asia D, central cord or not central cord, your motor recovery is about the same. So this, this idea that somehow it's different for spinal, central cord injury patients is actually not born true when you look at the data on how they recover over time. And finally, one of the, so that is a perception that needs to be sort of abolished too. So the extent of motor recovery between these cervical incompletes, those patients who are rushing to the operating room with their cervical incomplete injury and fracture dislocation, it's actually no different than the, the recovery potential in those with the central cord pattern of injury. <clears throat> now, one of the other concepts that Staskis kind of proved to us was that early surgery is actually pr pretty safe. Very few patients in the Staskis study actually deteriorated. So this idea that, well, we've got to let this spinal cord kind of cool down, that isn't really borne out to be true with contemporary surgical techniques. The final kind of perception is that um, there's this sort of concept that, hey, you know what, all the lab studies, they've actually shown that you should decompress the spinal cord early. <clears throat> that is actually true when you look at animal studies of spinal cord injury, and this was a kind of a meta-analysis that was done back in almost over a decade ago. And the conclusions from that is that there indeed is strong preclinical evidence for, uh, for early surgical decompression in animal models of spinal cord injury. And this was then kind of, you know, the part of the justification for why we should be doing this in, in human patients. But if you look at actually this preclinical evidence, so this is in rat models and dog models and whatnot of spinal cord injury, there were actually at that time 17 studies that had been reviewed showing that there was a benefit to early surgical decompression. But all of them used animal models of slow spinal cord compression. These were not like weight drop models where there was like this sudden violent force on the spinal cord. These were like, you put an epidural balloon and you inflate it, or you put some sort of compression pin on the spinal cord and very slowly, slowly compress it. So <clears throat> what does a low velocity compressive injury most resemble? Does it most resemble the 24 year old female with that injury or does it most resemble this injury? And I would argue that, that all of that preclinical literature is actually more supportive of doing surgery for the lower energy compressive injury. So I think that uh, there is indeed lots of animal data to support doing early decompression, but it's actually probably most applicable to the patients with central cord injuries, such as the one that I presented to you. So is there any empirical evidence that early surgery is actually better for central cord? The one that had been cited for many years was actually a part of a spine trauma study group uh, initiative, and it showed that these patients had probably uh, early, the early patients, early surgery patients had a small motor score recovery benefit, about six points, and they actually had a benefit from FIM. This was one of the only studies that really showed a benefit to early surgery in central cord patients until Michael Failings published this paper last year, um, which was a, a much larger study. And they came to the conclusion that early surgery had a small improvement in patients for upper extremity motor function, about two points, so not a huge uh, difference. And the largest benefit was actually seen in the patients with the Asia C injuries as compared to the Asia D injuries, probably because there's a ceiling effect with the patients with Asia D injuries. So obviously not every patient with a central cord should be rushed to the operating room because uh, these are often elderly patients with a lot of comorbidities. But I think it is time to start thinking differently about the management of these patients. They don't all do well. Their neurological recovery is actually not that different from the incomplete tetraplegic patients that you are rushing to the operating room. The clinical, the preclinical literature is actually very supportive and applicable probably to this patient population. And I think with contemporary surgical techniques, surgery is not unsafe in these patients that have, you know, a hotly um, injured spinal cord. <clears throat> 
And I think that this idea that, well, you know, hey, I see these incomplete cord injuries with fracture dislocations, I'm rushing that patient to the operating room. But these central cord patients, these patients are different, and I treat them differently. And I think this has no, to change. No different, only different in your mind. You must unlearn what you have learned. So I think that it is time that we start to be thinking differently and, and, and learning some of, what, like some of the same stuff that I was taught as a resident about just letting these patients kind of sit and wait. Okay, so now I'm going to go back to some of what I originally planned to talk about, which is around um, some of the more, some of the novel aspects around spinal cord injury. So I'm going to talk about biomarkers, because biomarkers is again something that was very, is really big in the traumatic brain injury space. And if the TBI guys are studying it, what about spinal cord injury? So as part of our camp or clinical trial, we had a lot of CSF samples that we were taking from the drain. And every time we took a CSF sample, we took a blood sample. And so this was to try to characterize what was going on, the, that pathophysiology of spinal cord injury, and try to establish biomarkers of injury. And we found with some of our early work that if you studied the cerebrospinal fluid after acute spinal cord injury, you could see various inflammatory cytokines change, that these could actually help you predict what was going to happen from a neurological standpoint over time. And we have, over the course of time, published a lot of papers on CSF biomarkers of injury. And they can tell you some stuff about the biology of injury, because they're, they're probably the next best proxy to what's happening. And they can be used to, to classify injury severity and predict outcome. But the question has always been asked, well, what about the blood? Because it would sure be nice if we could take blood samples instead of CSF samples for this. In the brain injury space, there's a lot of work that's been done on a variety of different protein markers uh, as blood bar biomarkers of, of TBI. And so we were very interested in neurofilament light, which is a, which is a protein associated with uh, axons, and GFAP, our glial fibrillary acidic protein, which is a protein associated with astrocytes. And there's a lot of work on these, these two particular proteins in the TBI space. So there was a strong rationale to actually test these in the spinal cord injury space. And we had the unique opportunity of having paired CSF and blood samples from our patients. So because every time the nurses would take a CSF sample, they'd also take a blood sample. So we did an analysis of 118 acute traumatic spinal cord injury patients with paired CSF and serum samples taken over the first four days after injury, so a sample taken every day. And this is where collaborating uh, with uh, Cheryl Wallington and, and her uh, research associate Sophie Stukas at the Brain Center in Vancouver using this Quanteric Samoa instrument. So how well do the serum and CSF levels relate? <clears throat> In 350 paired CSF and serum samples, you can see that the concentrations are actually pretty correlative. So they, they're like a thousand times higher in the CSF, but the relationship seems to be quite strong between the two. Now we asked, can you take neurofilament light levels and objectively distinguish between the Asia grades at baseline? And you can see the A's are in orange, the B's are in blue, and the, the C's are in green. And we took some normal controls, uninjured controls, and you can see that there is this injury severity dependent expression of the neurofilament light. Similarly, can you take the, the, just the patients that are Asia A and say, well, which ones would, which of these patients that are Asia A at the beginning would convert to Asia B, C, and D or remain Asia A after six months? Can you use the biomarkers to predict that? So here's GFAP taken over four days. And you see that the patients that did not convert, which are the patients in orange, have significantly higher levels of GFAP in these early stages. And to the point, and even particularly at three to four days post-injury, if you have, for example, a GFAP level of like 18,000, we're pretty confident that that patient is not going to convert their Asia grade at six months. And then this scenario where you see the patients you can't actually examine because they're intubated or sedated or whatnot. Can you use the blood sample to predict in six months, are they gonna be motor complete or motor incomplete? Totally agnostic to the initial baseline examination. It turns out that GFAP is actually very good at this. So these are the GFAP levels. In orange are the patients that are, remain motor complete at six months. And in blue, those patients that actually get some motor function back. And you can see that the levels are significantly higher in those that don't, don't improve particularly in the GFAP levels at, at three and four days post-injury. So we can actually predict with quite high certainty that if your GFAP levels are above like 16,000 at day three, this is a patient, even if you had no knowledge of their baseline neurological examination, this is a patient that will likely remain motor complete at six months. So we think that these are actually very promising blood biomarkers of injury. 
They're predictors of Asia grade outcome, just agnostic to the baseline Asia grade. And, uh, and it might actually be quite informative to have these even three to four days out after injury. Um, what's to come in this is that we are actually engaged in a, now a validation study of this, being funded by the Department of Defense, an independent assessment. We're actually going to test a point of care assessment device. So this is an Abbott device that can give you a GFAP measurement in about 10 minutes. And uh, we're doing further studies, further biomarker studies to support our international spinal cord injury biobank. Which is really the last thing that I'm going to talk about. This is a biobank that we've initiated in Vancouver uh, as a global research resource to the spinal cord injury community. Because we thought it would be great if people had the opportunity to study human biospecimens to try to understand the biology of, of, of human spinal cord injury. So we've accumulated uh, a lot of spinal, we've accumulated 14 spinal cords, over 25,000 vials of CSF, and, uh, and 24,000 vials of serum. Now, the spinal cords we're getting through this program that we've established where we realized that some patients were dying with spinal cord injuries in our hospital. And so we sought to actually get their spinal cords. This is an 81-year-old woman who had this fracture dislocation. She had her surgery, um, and then she underwent medical-assisted dying about 17 days after her injury. So we actually consented her to obtain her spinal cord after she passed away. We take the spinal cord and we, do, uh, we cut it into four and a half seg centimeter segments, and we do a, an MRI, and we build a little plastic sort of mold out of, uh, by 3D printing a kind of a com complementary mold. And then we slice the spinal cord into these three and a half millimeter segments that we paraffin embed. And so this is the series of these paraffin embedded blocks that represent the four and a half centimeters through the epicenter of the injury. And this becomes the substrate of the biobank. So if you have an interest in, for example, looking at that part of the spinal cord, we can send you sections of the spinal cord that's been taken through there. We know their Inski examination, we have an MRI, and all that information can be sent to facilitate a study. Our website has the ability to, uh, it has the information on how to request specimens. We subject all of the requests to a scientific board. Um, and uh, we've had a number of requests that uh, we've fulfilled for people around the world that have been asking us for tissue, either CSF, blood, or spinal cord sections. Um, this is a good example of what one of, the, one of those um, requests. So Christian Goritz had been working on pericytes and scarring after spinal cord injury in mouse models. And he said, well, I'd be really interested to know if these particular cells are actually relevant in patients with spinal cord injuries. So we sent him tissue, and this is actually now figure one of one of his papers. He's able to show that the cells that he'd been working on are in fact, they are in fact there in the injured spinal cord in human patients. Uh, and this was his paper that he published in Nature Communications two years ago. And, uh, and one of the things I, I point out is that we're not on the author list. So these are specimens that we send out without any expectation around authorship, except for they, they do recognize the, and acknowledge the biobank in, in the acknowledgement section. So it is meant to be a research resource for other people. So, so that's our, our biobank. So that's, uh, that's the, the spiel um, on uh, novel approaches, although I interspersed it there with uh, uh, central cord injuries. Um, there's probably a lot that I think we would learn in the SCI field from the neurosurgeons and the way they manage TBI. Um, I think translational research in our field really talks about not only just going from bench to bedside, but also taking problems from the bedside and going back to the lab to try to understand those better. And we've certainly done that around hem hemodynamic management. And, uh, and it is a hell of a team sport. Um, we, uh, one of the things that I think is really great about uh, being in the field and doing translational research is that it has certainly opened up the opportunity to do a lot of collaborations. And the International Biobank is a great example of this. Uh, we're collaborating now with groups really around the world. Um, a lot of people in our lab that are busy working on these uh, clinical and uh, scientific aspects around spinal cord injury. And we have a lot of uh, funding agencies to, to thank for for their support. So uh, with that, I want to uh, thank you for your, the invitation to, uh, to attend the, uh, the British, the Brit Spine meeting and uh, look forward to uh, further discussions as the, as the meeting goes on. So thank you very much. Um, <clears throat> thank you, Brian, for an absolutely wonderful keynote lecture. Um, I'd like to uh, invite um, members of the audience to ask any questions that they may want to ask Brian. Thank you, Brian. Uh, fascinating lecture. In the 
central cord syndrome, do you not feel that sometimes we are not aware of the pre-fall st status? So maybe that they sustained the fall because of a pre-existing myelopathy. Mm -hmm. And you may not be able to, you can't assume that they were normal before. So how do you kind of, uh, kind of rationalize that? Yeah, unknown? so the fact that they probably weren't totally normal before they fell. Exactly right. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think that that's, that's very true. I think there's probably a lot of those patients that have a subtle myelopathy that, was, that underpins the reason that they fell in the first place. Um, but I think that for a lot of those cases, because it, it is a very mild, um, it is a very mild myelopathy that they had before, um, that there's really no reason that to not decompress them and try to get them back to the state they were functioning in, uh, or as close to the state that they were functioning in uh, before they had their fall. So, so yeah, I, I think that I make the assumption that many of those patients. I mean, I think some of them are, you know, they they trip and fall like. Like anything, it just happens. But but clearly, some of those patients have had pre-existing spinal cord dysfunction. Um, but but I still think that uh, you know that early time point is the opportunity to actually um, you know try to make their that that's the opportunity to try to protect their spinal cord is in that early time point. Hi, thanks. That was a fantastic talk. Analogous to the traumatic brain injury world, um, where we see chronic inflammation in the brain causing ongoing problems, so these mm -hmm. are people who get an initial brain injury, mm -hmm. activation of the glial yep. innate immune system. Do you think that exists within spinal cord injury as well? And there, are you looking across the... the yeah, the that's a great question. And we think that there probably is. Um, so much of our work had focused really on the, the first three days after injury. and. If we looked at our inflammatory cytokines, for example, in the CSF, most of those actually normalize within the first 48 to 72 hours. But what we're seeing now in the, with our serum markers is that the dynamic is probably much more, uh, is much more longstanding. So the GFAP levels, at least we see, are starting to come, they're, they're very high, they're sky high, and they start to come down at four days, they're coming down. Except for in the patients that are most severely injured, they actually remain high. So there is something to learn from the dynamic. Neurofilament light, on the other hand, is actually still rising. And so, and one of my um, former fellows did a paper where they showed that even at a month out, those levels are actually still high. Um, in our current study for Casper, we're actually taking blood samples at three, six, and 12 months as well. So they get their seven days and then three, six, and 12 months. And we think that there is uh, probably a lot of ongoing kind of inflammation and other you know, things that are still changing within the spinal cord. Um, so, yeah, it's a great question. The, the spinal cord is clearly not normal, you know, even a, even a few months out after injury. Mike. Brian, wonderful exposition yeah. on spinal cord injury. Sure. If I understand you correctly, in terms of central cord injured mm -hmm. patients, it's the Asia C's that have the most to gain. But if we look at the Asia A's and B's, is, it, is there still a case for urgent <laughs> surgery because the proportional gains relative to where they end up in the end, it still makes that urgent surgery worthwhile despite their significant comorbidities. Sure. Yeah, I think that the, um, it is interesting, particularly now, and I suppose you guys are probably seeing this too, we have, you know, the prototypical central cord elderly patient falls, you know, no fracture, no instability, and they have this incomplete tetraplegia. We do see more and more of these patients coming in with complete injuries too. Right? because they're so wickedly tight and they have a fall and, and all of a sudden they're not like central cord you know, pattern of injury. They're like Asia B or Asia A. And I tend to think that these are the patients that probably have the best chance of, of neurological recovery after decompression because they have so little or they have so much less of a primary injury than if you, you know, run your car into a wall at 100 kilometers an hour. Um, like I, kinda, I tend to think that you know, when, you, when, you, when you kind of think about the kinds of patients we do rush to the OR, many of them have had such a massive primary injury that in a sense, like, you know, what are we doing to decompress their spinal cord? Well, we're trying to maybe save little bits on, or on the outskirts. But in, these, in the more elderly where they, you know, they fall, and so it is a fairly low injury injury, it's, it's primarily characterized by compression and probably ischemia, they probably have the most to benefit sense. So, um, you know, the, the big balancing act is obviously these are not the healthiest people in the world. And so 
that part needs to be kind of balanced about like, okay, well, you know, uh, and, and I think we talked about it last, a bit last night. Like I tend to not be like necessarily taking somebody like that into the operating room in the middle of the night, but I might do that as like the first case in the morning, like with, uh, with the A team. So, um, whereas, you know, a bilateral facet dislocation, I might be taking that in the middle of the night. For, Okay. <clears throat> Perhaps we have one time for just one last question, and then we'll let Good morning, go to the next Brian. session. Thank you very much for the talk. It's wonderful to listen to you speak again. Um, <clears throat> as you know, I've come back from Vancouver. I you've changed me. I've, I, you know, I've come back bringing the ideas that it has made me <laughs> we, think we about. Changed it. You, yeah, well, you've yeah. changed me, but I definitely <laughs> come back thinking so you should decompress these central cord syndromes early, and that's what I learned when I was working with you guys. I found it harder to implement it in practice in the uh -huh. UK and I've shared it with my colleagues. We've had our things around. One of the questions I get back is about the evidence, where they mm -hmm. say we've seen FIM improvement, we see AIS improvement, but what does this actually mean to patients? And should we be looking at other outcome scores for these patients? Because if it's spasticity yeah. and other issues, so is there any things you would want to look at instead in future evidence? Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that's a great question. That, and Bijan and Ravi published a paper a couple years ago showing that if you just look at motor function, it's almost impossible to tell the difference because they all hit the ceiling effect. Like, they all recover motor function. So if you're only focused on their Asian motor score and how much that improves with early surgery, it's really hard to show that. I'm, I'm actually amazed that Michael actually was able to show that. Um, although the effect size, I would point out in his, uh, uh, his JAMA paper, is like two points. So it is actually fairly subtle. I think you, where the gold is, is going to be in all those other things, spasticity, pain, balance, um, hand function. And, um, and it's hard to measure those things. Um, so we have an initiative at the AO Spine. Um, so in the AO Spine Knowledge Forum, we're, we're embarking on the study uh, called the INTWIN study, which is really going to be for the Asia Ds, like the really mild patients to say, okay, can we actually, in this patient population, after they have a spinal cord injury or a central cord injury, um, can we do a hand dynamometry test? Can we do a grasp? Can we do a balance test? Can we measure their spasticity? Can we measure their neuropathic pain? And then follow that over time. Because I think the answer to the question of whether or not these patients would benefit um, is probably in that, in those outcome measures, much more so than their Asian motor score. Um, and it's in some respects, it's not that dissimilar to the myelopathy, the mild myelopathy patients. Because when you look at the mild myelopathy patients, if you just look at the MJOA, it's actually oftentimes very challenging in the mild to show like a clinically meaningful difference in their, in their outcome. Um, and it has probably to do with a lot of these other outcome measures for those patients. Thank you very much. Okay. Okay, thanks very much, Brian. Okay. And on behalf of Brit Spine, I would like to thank you very much for your lecture today. Okay. Ah.